Hello everyone, my name is Yvette Martinez Vu and I am an academic coordinator at UC Santa Barbara. Specifically, I am the assistant director of the McNair Scholars Program. I completed my PhD in theater and performance studies in 2013 and that's actually when I made the switch off the tenure track into what some people call the alternative academic path. I'd like to begin with my positionality. I self-identify as a first-generation, working-class, Chicana mother scholar, and it's from this uh, positionality that I'd like to enter this conversation. I'd also like to thank Dr. Annie McClanahan for taking the lead in this conversation. She actually um, addressed two topics, a topic of debt and professionalization, and a topic of debt as a collective experience, and I'd like to continue on this conversation. So um, I'll start with some data from our prompt. On average, humanities graduate students accumulate a total debt of roughly $31,000. 12.4% of humanities PhDs have over $90,000 in student loans. In addition to a shrinking job market and the increasing difficulty of earning tenure-track positions after graduating from PhD programs, the specter of financial debt doubtless defines the horizon of what many students can imagine or aspire to in the future. So if we know that humanities PhDs will likely incur thirty to ninety thousand dollars worth of student loans, then I'm wondering what does that look like in everyday practice and what are the circumstances that make it so that graduate students must incur debt. Dr. Annie McClanahan actually mentioned the topic of hidden costs. These include costs for summer, costs for travel, which are usually not covered in graduate school. I agree with her that we need to be transparent about these conversations around hidden costs um, to better support our students as they seek training and professionalization. And um, I'd like to kind of offer a personal experience. Um, while in graduate school, at one point I had to work three jobs to financially support my family. I was working as a research mentor, as a scholarship advisor, and as a reader. Um, at the time, I was technically fully funded and on a prestigious external fellowship. However, the stipend from that fellowship did not cover the cost of things like childcare, which can easily be one to two thousand dollars a month for full-time care, as well as the cost to financially support a family under a single income. Um, so. I took on those jobs and ironically it was through these jobs that I gained the transferable skills that led to the job that I have now where I support underrepresented students, low income, first generation students who are seeking to pursue higher education. My main point in sharing this anecdote is that without having transparent conversations about debt and about the hidden costs of graduate school, um, and the hidden costs that these graduate students must incur, especially low-income students with dependents who don't have um, the kind of class privilege to depend on financial support from parents, from spouses, from partners, etc., then academia is going to continue to push out these underrepresented students because it's not, not providing them with the kind of structural support they need to thrive. Regarding the topic of community formation and debt as a collective experience, it can be said that that represents a kind of oppressive force that affects the way we live and see the world. Like any other form of, oppress of oppression, forming communities and forming a kind of solidarity is really important. On a separate note, I also want to call attention to the way that debt can be literally be a collective experience when you are partnered or have a spouse. So again, as someone from a single income household, I have not only incurred my debt, but I've incurred my partner's debt. And so that directly affected the kinds of jobs that I applied to after completing the PhD. I knew that I could not work as an adjunct and continue applying for tenure track jobs every year as some of my mentors encouraged. And so instead, to ensure my survival, I applied um, to different jobs, went a different route, and went decided to pursue a fulfilling career advising underrepresented students and providing the kind of service work that I enjoy doing, but that I also believe academia needs more of. 
Another way that I work to ensure the survival of scholars like myself is through my involvement with the collective of Chicana Mother Scholars called Chicana Mother Work. In this collective, we call attention to the many ways that academia does not systematically support low-income women of color mother scholars, and through our collective, we aim to end the silence around this topic and to create an ethos of collective resistance. Uh, similarly, I ask that those of us that are in debt to end the silence about this topic and to form our own forms of collectives that will push for policy change so that our campuses can create more forms of financial support for those students that need it. And similarly, I ask for a kind of cultural change so that academic uh, so that the academic culture can learn to address the topic of debt and so it doesn't become or remain a taboo topic as it is now where people are only willing to talk about it in theory and not in practice and especially not um, related to their everyday experience.